Okay, hey everyone. So, why you should be viewing your performance? I've got like five minutes to talk about performance, so wish me luck. I have about four and a half now, no? Okay, so my name is Debbie O'Brien. I'm a friend and tech lead in Patterson Agency in the beautiful island of Mallorca. I'm a teacher at View School, a writer at Ultima Courses, a contributor for Webpack and Nuxt, and I do a shitload of other stuff. So that's me. Performance. Okay, I'm a performance freak. I've probably spent way too much time with Sean Larkin. Um, I absolutely just love performance. Uh, you should love performance too, and this is what you should be doing. You should be running performance tests. Now, we all know, you all know what you should be doing, so I'm just going to re basically remind you of what you should be doing and helping you do it. So be aware of what you're shipping. If you're shipping code, know what you're shipping. Use Webpack Analyzer to see what you're, what you're bundling, and basically just use what the tools you have. You have Chrome, so run an audit every now and again and check and see what you've got. Um, check your CSS with CSS stats, for example. Like, we have these tools. Um, the DevTools audit, basically you can just see, like, this is terrible, this is really bad. Most of your websites, company websites, probably look like this. So do something about it. Don't just look and go, oh my god, our site is so bad. No, actually act upon it and say, okay, what can I do? Google actually tells you everything that you can do to help make it better. So just actually use the tools you have. Um, if you're in the terminal, this is, for example, comes with Vue and with Nux and with every, everything else. It tells you what you have. And if you look there, you can see what pages are taking up too much and basically just analyze it, go through it. You'll see your chunk names and, and you can just see it straight from the terminal. If you're not a terminal person, you can use the Webpack Analyzer bundle. Okay, you just need to, to Im import this. And if you're using Nux, you just could put build-a and you just get it automatically. And basically, you can just go through this, see where your code is, what's taking up too much space, so from this, my Catalan text is taking up too much space, so maybe I should just remove Catalan. No, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> um, but the carousel, I hate carousel, so maybe I should move the carousel, but no, marketing like it, so I'm stuck with it. But at least here I know where and what's going wrong, and I can do something about it. Code splitting. If you're not code splitting, you should be. Code splitting is so simple. Basically, this is what you, how you normally import a component. This is in, in Vue or in Nuxt. And basically, all you've got to do is just use an arrow function, just change it to the bottom. But what we should be doing is code splitting from the start. So don't just you know, import your components and then later I'll refactor it. No, start the right way. So if you've got a, a base hero, a hero component, for example, then don't code split that hero because that's the first thing that your page is going to see, be, that's going to be seen. Unless your hero is a really crap hero. And if he's a crap hero, he's going to be down at the bottom of the page and he's never going to be seen, or maybe. So code split him. So basically choose. You're going to know what to code split, so do it from the start. When you do have to work with a lot of languages, so I work in Spain, so we have like a lot of languages, um, basically you just have to put lazy true in the internationalization, and then you lazy load your languages. So that's really, really important, because if you're in Catalan, you're not going to open the Spanish translation, and if you're in Spain, in another part, you're not going to open the Catalan one, so you don't need to load that at first load. So lazy load translations. And also, lazy load your images. So um, this is a plugin I use just for lazy loading images, and it's really simple. Someone built it, and I just use it easy. So just do it so you're not basically loading all your images on first download. And Chrome now has the, um, the lazy images native. That didn't change, although it's changed here. It's kind of magic, but never mind. So why is it not changing? It's not changing, but never mind. I'll just keep talking. So um, lazy loading from Chrome. Chrome now has the lazy loading um, out of the box, so you can use that. It's not going to work in Internet Explorer, but that's fine because nobody cares about Internet Explorer. Um, my slides are not changing, so tech people, that's not working. Um, use a CDN for your images. Oh, there we go, we got it. They did it, good. So um, if you're basically loading a load of images, you should be using something like Cloudinary. And um, what's really cool is this Q Auto and F Auto. This basically optimizes your image images automatically for you. So it's basically going to ship the image. So if someone puts up a two megabyte image, you don't have to worry about it because what you're going to download is the right optimized image. It's also going to also going to use a WebP if it's on Chrome and a normal JPEG if it's on Internet Explorer. So they do that all for you. Styles. Try and use utilities, classes, uh, frameworks. So Tailwind is my favorite, and you're basically building your CSS through utilities so that you don't end up with too much CSS. This, for me, is, is fantastic. This is something that's using um, Bootstrap, which I hate, but never mind. Um, and as you can see, it's like this 2,260 font size declarations. That's just too many. You don't need that. So uh, 1.18 megabytes of styles, like that's bad. Use Purge CSS to remove unused styles or use Tailwind like we did, and we got 16 KB for our CSS. So that's basically what you should do. Um, build static sites. Static sites are so much faster, so just do it. Think about it. They are dynamic. They're not static. They just 
basically being done in, in the browser. They're, or in the, at build time, they're being built and they're sent, so you don't have to download it. It's much faster. Um, you've got to put performance first and basically aim per, for perfection. I'm almost there. I'm at 99. This is our site. We need to get 100. If you can get 100, let me know. Um, basically, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so testing the front end. Um, I do believe that testing the front end shouldn't be that hard. So I'm going to share uh, a way that I found to test your front end applications in a pragmatic way. I'm Adria, I'm a senior, whatever that means, front end engineer uh, in a company here in Barcelona. And I'm also a maintainer of a testing library. You might have heard of that before. Uh, if not, you're going to do that now. Uh, you can find me on my blog, Twitter, or by running npx of Uncle on your bash terminal because I'm a bit nerd. So let's say I have five minutes, so I'm going to show you a day to day example uh, of a test. Not really, I'm just going to use a counter component. Um, so you can see that, right? Yeah. Um, this is a test for a view component, a counter component. Um, who is using view? Mm, okay, okay. React? Okay, you won, but. It's not a competition, right? Anyway, this is like using, uh, because we lost, so this is like enzyme to some extent. So this is the official way of testing components where you would just um, get the component instance and check that the state is, the initial state is right or it's zero. Then you would call a method or something, uh, make sure or assert that the, the right thing has changed, and then probably assert that the right message is there in the DOM, right? So this is how you would test a view component. And that was my, no, just kidding. So this is the component, and this is the way that it's officially uh, sold. But there are issues there. Um, what happens if I change the, the count variable to uh, the count state to, uh, I just re rename it? Or if I stop calling increment from my button? Well, the test might pass, and the component might be still failing. So we can run into false negatives, where a test is broken, but the component is not or false positives, where a test is still passing and our component not, it, it isn't. So this happens, or this usually happens, uh, and this kind of undermines our confidence in, in our testing strategy, and this is uh, a root cause uh, for uh, frustration. So this happens because of implementation details, right? Um, I think that we kind of know that implementation details is not the way to test, but still tools kind of um, promote that, that uh, behavior. What do we understand uh, as implementation details? Well, it's two things, mostly. First of all, when a test does something uh, that the component, sorry, that the end user or other developers are not doing, so it's behaving like a third user, or when a test breaks on a refactor. If you're just refactoring your component and a test breaks, that smells like implementation details. And this is why uh, someone came with a DOM testing library. It's a, who has heard of DOM testing? Okay, okay, nice. So that person was can see dots. And the guiding principle for the library is that the more your tests resemble the way that software is used, the more confidence they can give you. And with that, with DOM testing library, a, a lot of ports for several uh, libraries and environments came out to. Um, we chose weird animal emojis as a icons because we could. And um, in the case of view, the view testing library is just a, a very slight, uh, lightweight solution for testing view components and is built on top of the official uh, view test utils. Uh, same thing goes with React testing library. I think it's built on top of React DOM and React DOM test utils or something like that. So it's the same idea, just to provide a sensible API to test your components. So how would the test look like? First thing that we need to notice here is that we are rendering our counter, our, our component, and we get a uh, utils collection in return. So we, could, we would get the get by text utils, for instance, and then we would just assert that the right text is there. So we are just querying the DOM and making sure that you click zero times is there. Get by text throws an error if it doesn't find the matching string or regular expression, so that's an assertion. Get by text also returns the associate, uh, associated DOM node. So in this case, it's a button. And then we just click two times the button. That's it. We are not dealing with the component instance. 
Finally, we just expect that, or we just assert that the expected text is there. The main pattern here is that we are querying the component as a user root, and we're also acting upon the component as a user root. We are reading text and we are interacting uh, using events. The funny part with that is that a React test for a counter component uh, written in React would look almost the same. I just removed the async part because it's not needed in React, but, and we are using JSX to render the component, but it's the old same idea. We're just using the DOM, so we are just querying uh, all components the same way. This is, this is the way to go uh, if you want to avoid uh, implementation details, and also the way to go if you want to avoid uh, framework details on your, on your test. Your test should be uh, unaware of the, of the framework that you're using. So in the testing library community, we kind of value interacting with DOM nodes over component instances. So there is no VM, there is no component instance, there is no internal state leaked in our tests. We focus on the confidence each test provides instead of focusing on code coverage. And also we provide a simple and flexible API over having several ways of doing the exact same thing. In short, we try to use the tools that resemble the way uh, your software is used. If you want to learn more, we have a collection of repositories and the docs where you can read more about this library. And that's all I wanted to tell you. I have a stickers if somebody wants a stickers, so thank you for your time. Okay, um, give feedback to the users. I guess this sentence is like very familiar if you are a designer. But if you're a front-end developer, it will be as well because we work for the users, right? And in this talk, I'm just going to explain to you that there are many different ways of give that feedback to users, especially when it's like asynchronous content. Okay, so when you ha you are waiting a an action that's happening, and then you have this weird time that the user doesn't know if something's happening or not because you just have a, no a function working underneath. And we want to give that feedback to the users that something is happening, but sometimes it's, we are a bit like, okay, how should we do this? Because this seems like a very difficult task to do. You enter to Twitter right now, you will see like a bunch of loaders working everywhere, and it's kind of like not very nice way of doing it. So that's why skeleton screens are like a very, nice way of just bringing content to the users that it seems similar to actually like the final content, even if we don't know what content is going to be. So in this blog post that you actually can just go to my website and check it out, so this is just a, a summary of all of it. And I explain you how to do it, I explain you how to design it, and afterwards how to code it. And I can tell you it's way easier than it looks like. So the first part, as you see, can, can you actually see it? Uh, let's do one thing. I think now it's better, right? So the first step is just uh, checking like, which is the synchronous and asynchronous content, because this is very important. Uh, in this example, we have a, a data table, which is actually a very difficult example of like creating a skeleton a screen width because uh, you have all these divs that you have to manage somehow to put like animation of it and that's why I just took the most difficult part, like the most difficult example to show you that it's not difficult at all. So imagine this is like all my, uh, my favorite songs, I have them in a data table and uh, well, this uh, Spanish song is quite long actually. And um, I just um, know which is the synchronous content and which is the asynchronous content. Uh, remember that we don't actually know which, uh, which songs are going to load because, well, you don't know me that well to know it beforehand, right? So now that we have it, uh, we have to, design a way that um, it doesn't matter how many um, rows are we are going to have, um, the users uh, can just 
know that this is going to be the content, right? So it doesn't matter if finally the asynchronous content loads like one row or it loads like 50. And I just did that way that uh, just putting three of them, uh, it can similar like there's going to be a non-defined numbers of, of rows. So this is just an example and a gif of uh, what we want to achieve, right? Okay, so this is like the, the final, like once it's loaded, we will get this table. Let's start to code it. So the first thing we have to do is actually to code the fake content. Uh, as you see here, we, I, I use view, but it really doesn't matter. Like um, you can just use it with um, any, uh, like it, it, with plain HTML if you want. Like the whole trick is in CSS, so don't worry about it. So I have here, like I just code uh, um, three rows in, in this data table, and then we're going to do the magic that is all the animations, that they look difficult, but it's not at all. So the first animation that we do is uh, just a vertical animation, okay? You have all the calls the, in, the, in the website, just check it out afterwards. Uh, we create this uh, animation, they just uh, uh, vertical one, and it just is starting to look like more a uh, skeleton screen, right? Then uh, we have the most complex part, that is the or horizontal uh, animation. And the horizontal animation, um, I don't know how, how many of you have worked with Photoshop or Sketch for, like, can you raise your hand? Okay, so we have uh, uh, some kind of designers here as well. Um, there is like this part uh, in um, uh, Photoshop or Skates that the, they are called, uh, 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 how they are called? Well, a layer opacity properties in blending modes. And uh, these are very nice because uh, actually Yuna Kravitz yesterday spoke about it. They just, you can just play with, uh, with the layers and very uh, cool stuff. And it, it will allow us to do like what we want to achieve. So you have all the code here, but this is like the total animation that we have just to pass through all this, um, all this div of the whole of each row. So in, when you look at this, it's like, oh no, this, this is not like what I actually want to achieve. But um, if you just put like this mixed plane mode overlay, it means that uh, it will only apply uh, uh, all this animation will only be applied to the actual, um, all the dark parts uh, are in the inside the div. So magically, we end up with our final result, that is this one, and this is actually what we want to achieve. And it's all the magic is just in a mixed plane mode CSS property, so this is super cool. And uh, that's why CSS, um, and the latest CSS properties are giving, it, giving us so much power. Uh, you also have the, like the final result of it uh, here, and we are, can just try it out. Um, this is the loading, so it totally works. This is just a, a prop in, the, in my view, so in my view uh, file, so uh, whatever uh, you just have this is loading variable working, and you still don't have that information, you are just giving, just getting this nice skeleton screen that's actually showing you what the, how the information will look like. Works, right? So there is uh, some stuff that you have to have in mind, and it's that um, the, this mixed blend mode uh, in CSS, it's a property that uh, doesn't work in or a fabulous Internet Explorer or 8, which is a pretty, pretty thing, but uh, Microsoft said that it will come and you will be able to use it. So if you uh, don't mind to just don't support to um, 8 or Internet Explorer, then you can totally use it. And also, like, it only works if your background is white or totally black like actually the background of the text. Is the uh, buyer, like most of the time, this is how it works, so um, it is just a nice way of doing it. 
Um, if you have to give support to uh, Internet Explorers, uh, just can use uh, other other tools that I list here. They just using SVG, but uh, it's just way more complex, and you might not like it. Um, anyways, just an, an alternative. Uh, that's all. Uh, this is my website. I have like some other posts. I don't write that much, but if you're interested in design and uh, front end, you can just go to marinaisa.com and uh, tell me all our hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, hey, I'm Jakub Fodorovic. Uh, so it's yeah, some some places you can find me around. I uh, help to co organize the Wrocław TypeScript meetup. So uh, if you're interested in TypeScript, you can check this our Twitter. It's really, really a lot of good content. Yeah, I work on, uh, work in Calibra currently, and uh, yeah, also that community. That's real TLD. So you can check it out too. So. Uh, I want to talk, uh, let's talk about types. So I want to talk uh, shortly about nominal and structural typing in, uh, in TypeScript especially. So uh, yeah, what's the difference? Uh, basically, you know, types can be uh, either primitive, like booleans and strings, or more complex, like class uh, or object. And each type in each language have uh, usually like a name and a structure. And it seems like it's like a simple thing. So checking against name, uh, when compiler checks against name, when compares types, and we're supposed to say whether they're same or different, whether when it checks uh, against the name, then it's nominal. When it checks against the uh, structure, then it's structural typing. Also, some of some of some of you might uh, know the, mm, the term uh, duck typing, uh, which uh, uh, basically says that if it uh, if it uh, uh, quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, then it's a duck. So basically, structural typing, uh, duck typing is like structural typing, but in the, in the runtime. Um, okay, so let's see some examples. Uh, some languages like C, C++, Java, or Rust uh, are like uh, on uh, by default like they're they're nominal nominally typed. So you can see two classes here, uh, class person and class customer, which have exactly the same. Uh, structure, Bo both have the one property, which is uh, name, uh, this is Java actually, so, and uh, in case of, if you want to compile this program and try to uh, um, uh, set the uh, new person uh, mm, uh, instance to the customer uh, uh, variable, which is supposed to be a customer type, uh, the compiler will, uh, yeah, will error, will, <laughs> will break. Uh, on the opposite, and structural, Typing uh, like TypeScript, OCAM, Go, or Elm, uh, the structure is the, the important thing. So basically, so you, have, you see the same example. So customer and the person, the same fields. We uh, say that the P is supposed to be customer type, and we can initialize new person as the P, and the compiler will say it's okay uh, because the structure uh, is the same, and the, let's say the functions which are supposed to use. Uh, Customer type uh, can use this also instance of, of person type because the fields are the same. Uh, and what's more, the structure doesn't have to be exactly the same even. Uh, for example, in, terms in, 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 in the case of TypeScript, yeah, this uh, mm, person type in this case can have even more fields. So uh, both uh, customer and person have name, but person have also an H, but still we can use the instance of, instance of uh, uh, person type, of class of person type in, uh, as, a, as, a, as a customer, because it has all the fields that the customer has. Uh, so as I said, uh, TypeScript and Flow are mostly structural, and uh, mm, both teams have, uh, in Microsoft and Facebook, they decided that to use uh, that this is the more natural uh, mm, choice for, for dynamic nature of JS and where a lot of anonymous objects are used. And, but sometimes you, can, uh, uh, you, would, you, you would like to use nominal typing and can be achieved by several tricks. Uh, first, why? Uh, for example, the cases where you uh, want to, we, ha we have like a, yeah, mm, a customer and client, like um, objects, we have identical fields, but you have, you want to be sure that they're not used in the same contexts and the same functions. You want to use maybe uh, units of measure of special type, like kilograms, meters, centimeters, inches, which are all, let's say, integers or floats, but they have some special meaning, eh? they shouldn't be mixed. Or primitive uh, types like um, UUID, uh, like special types of strings. Uh, Okay, so I'll 
briefly go through some uh, hacks that can be used in TypeScript to, uh, to achieve nominal types. This is, uh, this is the uh, hack which is used even in TypeScript code base. Basically, you add uh, some constant uh, additional field like brand in this case. Uh, that's why it's called branding. And uh, then when you in uh, initialize a variable, you need to cast it on this, uh, uh, on this uh, uh, interface. You can use private class property uh, here. Uh, so if, if, there, if, if a class has private private property, uh, if it's uh, private, then it's always uh, it, it, the, the class or the interface becomes unique. So that's another case. And uh, you can also intersect with enums because enums are always are always unique uh, in in TypeScript. So if you intersect enum with a string, then it becomes unique. But uh, uh, just almost finished. This all the hacks might be not needed very soon. Uh, there's a PR ready by Wesley Wiggum, and uh, which introduces new unique keyword. You can see in the in the top. So here we define uh, UID as a unique string, and uh, then we can define, for example, guard function, like a function which decides whether a string is UID or not. Here it's just the dec uh, declaration that we we would need to implement it still, and you can see that when we try to get the user, uh, use the get user function which expects UID uh, with standard string, it will error, but if we use the guard in the, in the if block, then it, uh, the compiler will say it's okay. Thanks, that is all. Hi, thank you. Um, okay, so let me just start this talk by saying that this is the first time I do a lightning talk, and uh, just be gentle with me, thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so today I just wanted to talk about how we handle pull requests and maybe the whole process before shipping a, a feature or a fix into production. Um, what I'm gonna present is something that works for me and my team. It could be very subjective because, it, I mean, it works for us, but it might not work for you. But I think it's pretty cool, so I'm gonna share it with you. So, first things first, my name is Carla. Uh, I really like the picture and I want to thank, I just put it because I wanted to say thank you to the people from Cloudinary for it. Uh, you can find me on Twitter with my mother's last name, by the way. And also, <laughs> I am a software engineer at Sync. And yeah, so let's get to it. Um, like I said, what I wanted to share is how we handle the pull requests uh, and how we have structured them in order to make them more organized, automated, and just reliable to deploy to production without any problems. Because we really want to avoid things like this. We don't like to revert. We hate it. So, the first thing to do is of course to open and create your pull request. Then uh, what we do is we usually wait for reviews. We usually try to pair program a lot. So if you pair program, we usually wait for one more code review. If you didn't pair program, then we, we wait for two code reviews. And the good thing about code reviews is that I think it's a perfect time for like sh mm, sharing your knowledge with your teammates, so it's pretty cool to do it. Step three is to wait for the status check to pass. So in our CI process and in GitHub, we have a couple of status checks, the status checks that I'm gonna show you now. So, um, in this pull request, this is actually a real pull request I have open right now. Uh, it's been approved, and we have a couple checks, right? So what we do is we, uh, we run the test, unit tests, integration tests, and then uh, we create a Docker image because we were we Docker. Um, and then we have a couple of things there called danger, 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 danger. I don't know if anyone knows danger around here. Okay, a couple of hands, that's good. Um, so that would be the step four for us. It's to make danger happy. For those who don't know danger, um, it runs during the CI process and it gives us the opportunity to automate common code review chores. So it has support for a couple of languages like JavaScript, Swift, and Ruby. We use it for Ruby apps. And it kind of looks like this. Um, it complains a lot, I'm not gonna lie. So f the first thing that it usually does is, uh, is that the, this pull request needs QA approval. Um, so we usually, when we have a pull request, we QA it, and then we have to make 
danger know that, okay, this has been QA, this can be shipped, so we have to type QA okay or testing okay or something like that. Another thing is that <laughs> the pull request has, needs to be below 500 lines. I didn't do that, but it's just a warning. Um, and yeah, once we make danger happy, we can say we can deploy. So it's shipping time. And that is basically how we handle the pull request. Thank you very much. Okay, hold on. So back to here. So um, the title of my talk is How I Mesmerize Myself with Maze Generation. Uh, my name is Kevin Mays. Now, I assure you that's totally a coincidence. Um, you know, it's not like this stuff is, you know, a long-standing tradition in my family. Uh, I'm probably the first one in my family to do it, which actually means that I probably represent the maze generation generation of mazes. Um, so I live in New York City, and I work at a company called Giant Machines. We do great stuff there. Um, okay, so my story starts, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, kind of a typical Saturday. I'm taking my daughter to Barnes & Noble. And, uh, you know, she wants me to read, like, you know, 10 different versions of Frozen to her, and then we split up, and I go to the bargain books, and I see this interesting book called Extreme Mazes. Um, so, of course, I'm like, oh, it's only $7.98, I gotta get this book. Um, but I recently started adopting minimalism, so then I was like, no, just go, just leave. Don't do that. Um, so, at all this time, though, I never really stopped to think about how mazes were created in the first place, right? Then it dawned on me, you know, maybe they're using computers, and if they're using computers, then I can do that too. So how is this done? Well, Wikipedia knows all about this, and basically you just go to three different places. Uh, you have to check out the maze generation algorithm page, and there you will find out something about depth first search and backtracking. Okay, so for the next couple of weeks, all my evenings were like, put the kids to bed and eat some dinner, and then just like maze, 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 maze until they fall asleep. Um, so I only have five minutes to amaze you, right? So we need to see this quickly, um, so sorry, Wendy. Um, okay, uh, oh yeah, uh, exit. Okay, so here we are. So right now we're using P5.js and we're in their online editor. And this is a JavaScript library abstraction. Oh, it's not working. Oh, why is that not working? Oh, hello. <laughs> Just move it, I think you have to move it there or you can mirror it maybe. Yeah, there we go. Oh. Oh no, you should mirror it because otherwise you can't I see it. I want to mirror. How do I mirror? Uh, Command Shift P, setting, Panta pantalones. Oh. Pa pantalones. <laughs> Change my pantalones. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's just uh, displays? No, it. Displays? I gotta see Sorry? it. Mirror? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mirror. Can you, yeah. Oh, there's Thanks. a. I gotta see it too. Did you. No, just gotta go to conduct, man. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Yay! Okay, P5. We're back. Thank you. Gracias. Um, okay, so P5.js is an abstraction uh, over HTML5 Canvas. Uh, it's inspired by the processing language. Yay, generative art. Um, so here we have a simple grid of cells, it's just two by two. So this is what we're going to do, right? We're going to start with some random cell. Actually, we're going to start with the one in the upper left-hand corner. And we're going to look around at its neighbors. And we're going to try to find a neighbor um, that hasn't been, quote, visited. Um, and of course, any cells that are off of the grid are ineligible. OK, so what we do is randomly select one of those neighboring cells. And we break down the wall between those two cells. OK, now we're going to mark that cell as visited. And then we're going to add that cell to a stack, which, as we know, is just an array. And then we just keep repeating this over and over again. Um, so it's actually pretty simple. So let's see that in action, and this part is the depth for a search. Okay, so there, it went randomly to the right and then down, and if we do it again, it's gonna go, oh, if we do it again, it's gonna go, and if we do it again, it's gonna finally go, now nah, it's, well, it's random, so, you know. Anyway, so now we, let's get to the part where we do the backtracking, right, because this is pretty cool. So um, if we increase the grid size to a four by four, there's a greater chance that we're gonna hit a dead end. So if we hit a dead end, then what we need to do is backtrack. So we basically pop off a cell from the stack. Then we attempt to forge a new path in another random direction from there. And if that's not possible, then we just have to keep on repeating it over and over and over. And that's what the recursive backtracking part is, okay? Um, I'm glad the, the frame rate's keeping up there. Um, so then, let's say we have a somewhat larger grid and a higher frame rate. Well, that starts to actually look like a real maze. So that's pretty cool. Um, there you go. And then if we make an even larger grid and an even faster frame rate, then we can increase the border weight, which means thicker walls. And then we really need to have an entrance and exit or else it's gonna be very frustrating to get in or out of this maze. Um, and then I thought, well, what would be cool, you know, if we sort of like just reveal the path as the algorithm actually creates it. Um, now keep in mind, this is obviously gonna be much cooler if the overall shape of this uh, maze weren't just a simple rectangle, but you do get the idea, it looks kinda neat. 
Um, and so then finally I was like, well, we have the entrance and the exit. Why don't we forge two paths simultaneously from both ends? Um, so we can do that, and that looks really beautiful. Of course, there's kind of a problem, and you can probably spot the problem, and that is that the two paths never really connect since the algorithm itself specifies that a visited cells are not allowed to be added. So in order to solve this, I basically uh, arbitrandomly pick a cell somewhere in the middle of the, uh, the grid here, and then I check around, look at the neighbors, and if it's made from another path, then I break down the walls between them, and everything's connected. Yay. Um, okay, so meanwhile, back in the presentation that I just created, um, okay, so you should try this yourself, and it will mesmerize you. Um, so there are many other algorithms for generating mazes, and this has been done in many other languages, and not just rectangles, lots of other cool shapes. Um, so then I found out that somebody wrote a book about this, okay? So I temporarily suspended my minimalism uh, just long enough to hit the one-click button on Amazon, and it arrived just before this trip, and it's the one and only book I have in CJS. Look, there it is in CJS. It's by James Buck. Um, and so, what else can we do? Well, you know, we can make UI, and we can, you know, uh, make things more dynamic in terms of the size of things and the colors. Uh, we could also use masking and, you know, maybe some shapes to, you know, put mazes in cool shapes. Uh, we can create a JS library, maybe make it easy for all of you to make mazes. Um, and we can also print all this out and create generative wall art. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, so, you know, if any of this sounds like fun, then please come talk to me. Again, my name is Kevin Mays. Thanks. Woo! Hi. So I have my dad's first name and last name as my last name, so it's, <laughs> it can be controversial now. <laughs> All right, so why, <laughs> why do we need asynchronous patterns in JavaScript? So let me explain that with a metaphor. So JavaScript engine is like me. Yeah, you heard it right. <laughs> now you might be thinking this metaphor doesn't help because we, you guys don't know me, so I'm gonna tell something about me. <laughs> So I'm really bad at multitasking. In fact, I cannot multitask. And I'm like this person who fails every time I try to multitask. So when it comes to executing code, JavaScript engine cannot multitask. So at any given point in time, the JavaScript engine can execute only a single line of code or a block of code if it's a function. That's why JavaScript is called a single-threaded language. So now you might ask me, what's the issue with JavaScript being single-threaded, if, if at all there's an issue? So le let, me explain, let me explain that with an example. So this is a product list page from an e-commerce site. And on page load, you make a fetch request to the back end, grab a bunch of products, and display it to the user. And on the top left corner, there's an ugly-looking <laughs> go-to homepage button. So when the user clicks on that button, he gets redirected to the home page. So the pseudo code might look like this. On line two, we have the fetch to grab the product. And on line five, we have the click handler for the button. Now, let's say that it takes around two seconds to get fetch the products from the back end. And during those two seconds, if the user tries to click on the home page button, go to home page button, Nothing happens. The page is not. Uh, the button is not responsive. That's because JavaScript is single-threaded and it's still executing the fetch. So how can we overcome such issues and provide a better user experience? Asynchronous patterns to the rescue. <laughs> so some of the asynchronous patterns in JavaScript are callbacks, promises, async await. So now we could we can refactor line two to use a promise and JavaScript engine will not wait to execute line five when line two is still executing. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. We are, I am Guillaume, this is uh, Anthony, and we, uh, we, we do ask. front end at uh, iAdvise. And um, you're probably in the same case uh, as us. We work on big legacy React Redux uh, apps, and actually the one I work on, uh, there is uh, 50 and more reducers, 60 uh, midi uh, middlewares, and that's a lot. So uh, since a few weeks with uh, uh, Anthony, we started thinking about how we use uh, Redux, and for those who don't know, this is a JavaScript uh, library um, that manage uh, a state, and it looks like uh, this. 
you have uh, the view, something happens, so uh, there is an action uh, dispatched, and the action goes to the middlewares to do async stuff, and then to the uh, reducer to, with the old state, produce a new state. And because the state change, your view uh, render is, uh, itself um, uh, magically. And as a developer, what you are doing, you are working on three different uh, uh, area, your view, your middlewares to do um, asynchronous stuff, and your reducer for the data part. And with, uh, we started uh, to write down four main issues we have with uh, this, and Redux, uh, Redux is uh, great, but um, first we are forced to uh, split our code into at least two files, the reducer and the, mid, uh, and the middleware. And then this uh, logic um, uh, forced us to write a lot of uh, boilerplate. Uh, la uh, in this uh, example we have uh, for one workflow that is the, the logging, uh, we have uh, five uh, action uh, to, uh, to write. And with all that there is uh, no more one workflow, it's all split uh, everywhere. And at the end of the day, uh, it looks a lot like this, like middlewares uh, giving action, uh, giving commands with action to the reducer. So, of course, there is uh, libraries. We use a lot of uh, Redux Saga at uh, iAdvise, but still the same. We do nearly all the workflow uh, in our saga here, but uh, the data part is still in the reducer. So it's my turn. Hello. So um, with Guillaume, we were thinking about uh, this issue, and finally, uh, it all arose around this question. Um, are we thinking about action, or are we thinking about workflows? So uh, it means that do we write um, a switch case with a description of the effect uh, for each action? Or instead, uh, should we just write something like the functional workflow uh, we have in mind? So, um, well, we decide that uh, workflow are a good solution and the pattern we were using with Redux uh, doesn't fit for, for this uh, solution. So um, we thought about that, and uh, what we want is um, is more something like this: uh, a view that can listen to the workflow to know when to re-render. Um, that view can emit event to describe to describe what is happening into the interface and for the user, and workflows react to the event and do a lot of stuff. They do, uh, for example, in case of uh, login process when you just want to a notification for your application, uh, they, you want them to do, to store some data, to make some insynchronous call, to wait events or emit events. So you want them to do synchronous and asynchronous stuff in the same place, uh, unlike Redix. Um, the way you implement your workflow is up to you. If you just need synchronous action or uh, just write a reducer, uh, if you just need a reducer, and if you need something more complex, uh, well, in fact, you can. For example, back to the login workflow, uh, here is the, an example written with a generator and uh, something a la Redux Saga. So uh, just to log in to your application, we first wait for an event. Uh, when we receive the event, we can update the state of our workflow. Uh, after that, uh, to just to tell us uh, that the logging is ongoing. After we make a call, we can emit events, uh, we can do tracking, we can do whatever we want. Uh, we manage success or failure, and after that, uh, we got our, our workflow. So um, here, we got our logic localized. It means that you, uh, your workflow describes until your feature, and your workflow is your feature as a matter of fact. So, um, what's next? Um, this uh, pattern is, is not, uh, uh, there is no code uh, right now, 
uh, the code is not ready yet. In fact, you, we are still thinking about uh, the design right now. Um, if you have the same problem um, as us or some approach to share, uh, you want to contribute maybe uh, at this uh, thing or uh, interesting in creating the library, I d uh, a library I don't know, just reach us. So thank you for listening us. Yeah.